Takbir. Alhamdulillah, you're all awake. Inshallah, if we can have everyone start moving up and filling in the gaps, uh, we might have some more people coming in. This is supposed to be, inshallah, a very beneficial session from this seminar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Oh, you're falling asleep. Come on. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, you all woke up. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Once again, we welcome you all to the first annual Inspiring American Muslim Youth Conference in New Jersey. My name is Isa Abbasi, and I am presenting to you today with this session, Bridging the Generation Gap, where we shall discuss tactics among the parents within families at home to reconnect and the gaps that exist within the overall American Muslim community. I'd like to welcome Sheikh Yasser Bajas and Dr. Altaf Hussein to the stage. So Dr. Altaf Hussein is a native of Cleveland, Ohio, and a double alumnus of Case Western Reserve University from Cleveland, having earned his BS degree in biomedical engineering and his MS degree in social work. He received his PhD in social work from Howard University in Washington, DC. Dr. Hussein's research interests include the mental health and integration of immigrant and refugee families, and especially Muslim adolescents in the United States. He serves as a faculty member of COMPASS, the State of the Art Management Training Program of MSA National, a board member and chair of the Leadership Development Committee of the Islamic Society of North America, ISNA, and an advisory board member of the Peaceful Families Project, dedicated to the prevention of domestic violence. His past service to the community includes serving as a two-term national president of the Muslim Student Association and an executive committee member of the Muslim Alliance in North America. Dr. Hussein lives in Northern Virginia with his wife, Muna, and their children, Omar, Ahmed, and Asma. Dr. Hussein. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. My dear Sheikh Yasser, the uh, organizers of the conference and our attendees, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. You guys had lunch, right? Yeah, mashallah. This group had lunch. You guys didn't eat? Yeah, subhanAllah. Yeah, he makes space for them to eat. It's a generation gap already. Look, they can't eat. The, um, the topic assigned to us, and uh, um, inshallah, in the next maybe 15, 20 minutes, I'll try to, to cover some of these points, and I myself want to hear uh, Sheikh Yasser, is that <clears throat> today in America, they are second generation, third generation Muslims, and in some ethnicities, those who came in the early 1900s, they are also fourth and fifth and sixth generation uh, Muslims. So when we talk about generation gap, we have to stop looking at it from an immigrant uh, mentality and think that it's just about immigrants. For me and for many sociologists, when you talk about a second generation person, it's basically a person who's grown up in that country, if you will, born and raised in that country, and that's a result of a physical migration. So immigrants who came in 1960s, most of them after the 65 Immigration and uh, uh, Nationality Act uh, was reformed, then they came and brought their families, and that's the second generation. The one that we forget to talk about is the fact that African Americans and Caucasian Americans and Hispanic Americans, anyone who came to Islam in the 60s and 70s, they also raised children by virtue of a spiritual migration. They raised children in their homes, so those children have only known Islam in their entire life. So when I say second generation or third generation, I mean everybody who is in America who is a Muslim, whether of immigrant descent or of indigenous, inshallah, descent. So if we look at the importance of this topic, first and foremost, that it is critical to talk about bridging the gap because it's a phenomena that was not known to the Muslim community in, in historic Muslim sense, this is not something known. That there was no such thing as a gap between generations because oftentimes generations were being raised together. So the fact that we find ourselves a, a, uh, in, in this position of having now to turn back time, if you will, and go back and, and, and try to bridge what has become a real gap 
but from our culture should not be a gap at all. If you think and reflect on the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, literally everyone around him, SubhanAllah, were of different age groups. Omar ibn al-Khattab who came to Islam very late in his 30s, early 40s. So this is something you know, of, of a phenomenon in and of itself, that he made a transformation at that age. But clearly, in the, in the company of the Prophet ﷺ were people such as Ali ibn Abi Talib anhu, who is not only his cousin, but also then becomes his son-in-law, and then the fourth Khalifa of the, of the Ummah. So these are people who then came from nine, 10 years old, if you will, all the way through until uh, adulthood. So they were learning together. The one example that we know very clearly recorded is when Omar ibn Khattab anhu, used to have in his company uh, Ibn Abbas anhu that together there would be other elders and the elders would often you know, sort of kind of look at it and say, you know, how come when we sit together you have like, this young kid with us? Like what, what, what's up with that? Like why is he with us? And Umar ibn Khattab knew عنه, that uh, 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 Ibn Abbas was someone of tremendous intellect. Tremendous intellect. And so the child that's being raised in front of us may, be, may have tremendous capacity, but because we're following a sort of Western uh, a, 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 a model that's outside of our Muslim culture, we have you know, sort of put kids, little kids together, and then teenagers together, and then college students together. And this sort of uh, 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 divisiveness, if you will, is not something known in the, in the culture. One of those instances happened where uh, Omar ibn Khattab heard the voices of the, the people in this legend in his council, and he said to them, you know, uh, well, what do you say? You know, he wanted to test them. He said, what do you say when, I, when we hear the verses of, uh, of uh, Ida ja'a Nasrullahi wal Fat? He said, well, what, what, do you, what do you make of this? And the elders were there, they, you know, they gave a very literal meaning. They said, when the victory of Allah comes, which is translation essentially, that this will be the, the signal that many people will come into Islam. This is what the surah says. Then, Omar ibn Khattab paused and looked at Ibn Abbas anhu and said, Kalim ya Ibn Abbas, why don't you speak? Why don't you tell us what do you think of this? And he, subhanAllah, said that this surah, this surah foretells, it tells us about the coming, the imminent death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that his da'wah had been completed and now he was to return to Allah, subhanAllah. Now think about that because if you reflect on that, this was a young person sitting in the company of elders. He had taken in everything that the Prophet ﷺ taught him, plus what the elders taught him, but then he had internalized the message in a way that he could process it and then give of that. This is something critical to think about because in America now, alhamdulillah, we are able to raise children with values, with the values of Islam, but without, if you will, the cultural baggage that many of us may carry. Values tell us what is important. Values tell us essentially what is good and what is desirable. Values transcend time, but not space, because values essentially can be derived from a cultural context. However, faith values or Islamic values transcend both space and time. I know it's after lunch and the people who are like engineers are going, did he just talk about space and time? Right, it's okay, it'll be all right, I have a point, right? Faith values transcend space and time. Why is that important? Because the fact that we're living in America should not mean that the generations that have come and sacrificed before us, the African Americans, the Native Americans, the Hispanic Americans, the Caucasian Americans, all of whom entered Islam, and even the immigrants who came back to Islam have values that they should be teaching, we should be teaching our, inshallah, uh, younger generations. And those basic values to list, God consciousness, taqwa, kindness, compassion, accountability, justice, fairness, mercy, rahmah, uh, trustworthiness, a sense of ithar, all of these things we have to be able to uh, impart to our younger generations. And somebody may say, well, what is the example of that? Well, the example of that is the Prophet Sallallahu who in his own household had multiple generations had multiple generations, why? Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed that he would marry, he would marry Aisha radiallahu anha, she was clearly several decades removed from the age of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had his cousin, Ibn Abi, uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, growing up next to, uh, with him. He had the companions, as I mentioned. He was a husband, he was a father, he was a grandfather, he was a father-in-law, he was head of state. All of these things are going on, 
but he also had an ability to transcend the physical chronological age gap and to be able to communicate and relate to anyone who came in his presence, anyone who came in his presence. And this is critical for us to think about. And these values are important for us to be able to, uh, uh, you know, to, to impart to our children. One of these teachings that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said was Man lam yuwakkir kabirana wa lam yarham saghirana falaysa minna That he taught us that one who is not, who does not honor or revere our elders and does not show rahmah, mercy to our younger one, little ones, they, that person is not one of us. What's interesting here is that for a young person growing up in America now with our limited masajid space, limited places of worship, the young child coming to the masjid, the first place that they may act, the first uh, interaction they may have with another adult, not of their family, may be of somebody yelling at them to be quiet, to stop running, to don't do this, to don't do that. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had his grandchildren, Hassan Al-Hassan and Hussein radiallahu anhum, who used to play on the back of the Prophet ﷺ, when he was in sujood and he prolonged his sajda so that he felt they had been, they, they felt some contentment from their playtime, if you will. Compare that to what I grew up with. I mean, I had difficulties growing up because in the masajid, there were always these self-appointed sort of police people who were constantly patrolling for the, for the kids who were misbehaving. And we weren't actually even misbehaving. We were just being ourselves. And they would yell and they would be very upset and, and, you know, and, and almost in a very uh, impassionate way. No change would come of that because we would just be angry at them. They would be angry at us. And subhanAllah, in this one hadith that the Prophet is telling us that the, the one we, young, should be revering and honoring the elders, the, the adults in the community. But the adults should also be showing rahmah, mercy towards the young. And the Prophet is saying, the, 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 the tawqeer of al-nas, the, the honoring of the, the people, if that's missing in this one, if the mercy is missing, then that person is not from our community. And that's a tremendous gap to be filled uh, uh, by, by us, each, each and every one of us. Now, if you think about how to go about doing this, I would recommend that we really take a hold of this issue and make it a family learning experience that every family should have a learning plan. It doesn't matter if you outsource the learning to a Islamic school, to a private tutor, to public school slash supplemented by the weekend school. However it happens, the family has to take responsibility for the learning plan. Why? Because the family knows best the strengths and the weaknesses of every member of that household. We know best who sits still for the longest time. We know best who learns by looking at the teacher and who learns by reading. We know best who learns by listening. And these things are learning styles, learning styles that can only that once known can help inshallah ta'ala to help to promote that learning. But if every family does not take responsibility for that, we will leave the bridging of this gap to complete chance to complete chance and whatever happens, subhanAllah, we will just be always reacting to what's happening before us instead of being proactive and taking control of it. Now, what does that mean? It means to role model the values that I spoke about. It means that the parents have to show that when we talk about taqwa, God consciousness, that we actually model that taqwa. We model God consciousness to our children and that we point out to them that their own grandparents, and we show the, 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 the intergenerational impact of this, of how conscious of God they were, and indeed how we're attempting to model that. And then it doesn't have to be a very abstract exercise. It doesn't have to be theoretical. It can be as simple as telling ch children that even though you do not see Allah, you have to obey, you have to follow, you have to listen. Even though we may not be with you after you're grown up and you go off to college and other things, your God, the values will remain with you. But if that, that's not role modeled, the gap exists, why? Because sociologists tell us that assimilation, assimilation to any society, any culture occurs when the relevance, when the relevance of the original values starts to decline and decrease, such that the person being told something has no sense of a connection. So when you tell someone, have taqwa, if you translate that as fear Allah, then the child grows up for the 
formative years only talking about the fear of Allah, the fear of Allah, never about the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, never about the love that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, never about the forgiveness that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so to avoid that level of uh, decline in the relevance of the values, we have to model it constantly. We have to be there for our children to be able to show them, inshallah, that this taqwa is truly a part and parcel of a Muslim's existence. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that in the Quran, that for the believers, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu, ittaqullah haqqa tuqati. That, O oh, you who believe, be conscious of Allah as He deserves that you be conscious of Him and do not die or pass away in a state except that of Islam. Now, interestingly enough, if we role model something, be ready for the fact that children will imitate that. So if we are mediocre models of that behavior, our children can at best be mediocre, if not worse, than what we are or who we are. So we have to look at that and say, I remember a story where a, da a dad was praying and uh, the child was bothering him and he kept saying to him, you know, ya abi, ya abi, ya abi. And then the father finished and he said, you know, when a, someone is praying, you never disturb them, no matter what's happening. The, father, the, the child listened and he said, okay. The next day, the child was in the kitchen. He was trying to reach for a glass and he broke it. And the dad heard the glass breaking. He said, who did that? And he started running after the child. The child ran around the whole house and he got stuck in the corner. He said, I have no place to go. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> huh? Because what did the father say? Right? The father said what? When you never disturb somebody when they're praying, no matter what happens. He said, okay, all right, try to get me now, right? Allahu Akbar. Right? And then if he knew Bakara, he might have started with Alif Lam Mim and started going for a long time, right? They will model whatever you say. They will look at it and say, what about Rahmah in the household? We talk, often talk about these values, but we don't see them occurring. We have to be able to show that between husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, children and grandparents. Now the worst thing happening in America is that we're imitating the society that in which we're living in the wrong things. The elderly in America are, are growing at a rapid rate in terms of their numbers in the population, the percentage of the population, the graying of America, of the baby boomers. Many of them are in nursing homes. Many of them are living a very desolate, uh, a lonely life. But now I'm finding out the more I travel, the more this is the case of Muslim families, of Muslim elderly, those who killed themselves, their blood, sweat, and tears, so that we could be where we are today, are finding themselves, no one calling them, no one visiting them, no one even asking them if, if they need anything, no one even checking up on them, helping them. You know how we can bridge in a practical way? The rahmah and the compassion, the mawadda that Muslims should have, we should look in our community and say, who in our community is elderly? They have so much to share with us, so much wisdom, so much lived experience. Why don't we get our children? My son is now only 10, but the, suppose your son is 16 and 17 and always wants to drive, you know, as soon as they get their license, you're like, do you want to go get the milk? Yeah, I'll go get milk, right? Can you go get milk again? Yeah, I'll go get milk again, right? He'll go every five minutes because they want to be in the car to be driving. Why don't we say to them, you know what? Amu so-and-so needs a ride for Salatul Jummah. So that's what you're going to go and do. You're going to pick him up or you're going to pick her up and you're going to bring him to the masjid. In that interaction, let that unfolding take place. Let the unfolding of those values take place whereby the elders can tell the young people what they lived through, how difficult things were, what the fact that they, they could not just look up on a GPS where the next masjid was to pray because there were no masajid to pray when they were living in this country and look where we've come from, from where to where. This rahmah will come when, through service, through the ability of our children to learn to serve not only their parents, but even those of the community who are in need, subhanAllah. And, you know, the, the, the justice and fairness value. One thing I find in the Muslim community, there's a lot of uh, uh, hypocrisy in how we're raising our boys and girls. And I used to say this point before, I only had two boys. But alhamdulillah, now Allah blessed us with asma, so I have to really live out what I'm saying, and we have to stop that. Over the generations, we've been doing what? We've been focusing on the girls, young ladies, women, and raising them as if they, want, they should be, they're the most precious thing ever, they deserve all our attention, and then to the boys, we give them pizza and soda, and we're like, raise yourselves basically, right? Raise yourselves basically, and then maybe if you, as long as you pray between the basketball game, you'll be okay, right? 
And I think this is creating a different kind of gap. It's creating a gap, and Sheikh Yasser will discuss more about the actual concept of marriage and, the, and that gap, but it's creating a, a gap that basically says what? That certain things are modeled so that only men do, and certain things are modeled that only women do. So when it's coming now time for us to help them to really live in society, to be mature adults, they have no role modeling of transcending that barrier of transcending that barrier and saying, you know what, there's nothing wrong with me doing X, Y, and Z to help in the household. Asked about the life of the Prophet the, 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 the narration tells us, that he used to be in the mahna or khidma, the service of his family. Where is the role modeling of that? How can we bridge the gap if the fathers were never present when the babies were born? Never present when the diapers were changed. Never present when the laundry was to be done. Never present when the house had to be cleaned. Never present for those things. So another entire generation is growing up thinking that this is the domain of somebody else. Somebody else. And believe me, in our household, we, we boys, we men, boys and men, we do the laundry. We clean the bathrooms. We basically do the, I do the ironing, my young, the kids are too young. But no, no, you don't have to clap because <laughs> I have to talk to these guys. They need to clap. See, this side always claps. When I say this, this side claps, this guy's like, dude, get this guy off the stage. Like, <laughs> isn't his time finished? <laughs> isn't he done, right? No, why do I do that? Because my mother taught me. See, is what? <laughs> yeah, it's time for Dr. Yas. He's going to be tougher. Wait, wait till he comes. He has seven points. I'm, I'm only have like five points. He has seven. So, uh, so the idea is what? That we're going to be duplicating some of the ignorance of the past that put the entire burden of raising a generation onto the shoulders of our sisters and somehow we escape that. And I'm saying that let us help to bridge that gap, inshallah ta'ala, by, by really taking this on first and foremost in the, in the, in the practical ways of, of serving in our families. And, and, and I'll speed through this, but let me close with ithar. The, generational, the, the gap between the generations will be bridged when we internalize the meaning of ithar. That ithar in the Quran is mentioned in Surah Al-Hashar when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the relationship between the muhajireen and the ansar. That the Ansar preferred the Muhajireen over themselves, even though their own condition wasn't that better off. What I'm talking about is a sense of parental ether. Where were you all this time? Man? Oh, mashallah, alhamdulillah. Right? Uh, so the idea was what? That they had little, the Ansar. The Muhajireen came having given up everything. For the sake of the, the hijra was a spiritual hijra. And in this case, that ithar, in English, the best way I can talk about it is to say it is a deliberate, conscious, intense preference of others over myself. Others over myself. Imam al-Ghazali says that indeed our goal should be not to burden others with our desires, but to burden ourselves with the desires of others as long as they're not displeasing to Allah. Now imagine in our household right now, little kids from birth are talking about mine, this is mine, this is for me, right? What about me? What's in it for me? If we replicate this in another two or three generations, the sense of karama, of justice, of generosity in Islam, that value will completely leave us. To the extent that I fear to think what would happen when if now we're seeing some of the elderly alone and no one is checking up after them, they're in nursing homes and whatnot as Muslims, what will happen if this sense of ithar is lost? And I am recommending that we begin with parental ithar. Parental ithar means we have to model the behavior at home of turning off the Blackberry, turning off our cell phones, turning off the television, turning off the movies. Why? So that when we come home, that generation gap can be bridged by interactions. See, if we're never interacting with the kids, how do you expect them to even know who we are? To this day, I ask my father, uh, Hafidullah, who's 75 now, subhanAllah, I still ask him about things that he remembers about his father and then hopefully his father's father so that I can then use them at bedtime stories for my children. So bedtime stories become what? Some things from the companions, some things from the life of the Prophet but also some things from our own families. 
if they never know the other generations and the sacrifices they make, the sense of ithar they had so that everybody else could succeed and survive, what could they possibly uh, know about being unselfish? What could they possibly know? They will never come to know that. So we ask, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us as parents, particularly to model the sense of ithar. It really has to start with us. And I believe me, I'm the first to do this. Allah blessed me with a commute of an hour and a half uh, on, on really bad days from Washington DC, uh, from Virginia to Washington DC to Howard University. And in the beginning I thought, SubhanAllah, like this is a how am I gonna manage this? But then I realized I can listen to Quran, I can do adhkar, and then the best thing is, all the phone calls I used to take at home, and then keep telling the kids, not now, not now, not now, I can put on my earpiece, and take the phone calls between that hour and a half. So when I walk in the door, I'm theirs and ready to be theirs. So they can actually start to learn what it means to be as a family, to eat as a family, to pray as a family, to learn as a family, to sacrifice as a family, to give as a family, all of these things. And in closing, really, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help this generation that's coming up now to be better than the ones that preceded them. Not because the ones that preceded them failed in any sense, but because we want every generation that's coming to be better, to improve and to advance the state of affairs. And this starts with the sense of values. And so imparting the sense of values means that we have to be generous with ourselves, generous with our time, generous in the service of our, of our, of our families and home, and most importantly, generous with, in the sense of mercy and rahmah so that our children can watch. Believe me, one thing they do very much so, and the scholars say, if you want to truly know about hypocrisy, it is to listen to the, from the children the state of the, their homes. Children are very honest in the description of the state of their homes. So whenever things go really badly, social workers and psychologists often end up working with the children and just let them draw sometimes. Let them sing or make a, 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 like a funny song, and, or a, not a funny song, but a song. And it, ultimately the kids pour out their emotions from that. And what we're saying is that if the home condition is messed up, already there's a gap between just the parents and that child, the children. Then if you've marginalized the elders, the grandparents, there's already a third generation there involved that's gapped. And then what's happening? Basically, these kids growing up here will be without roots. They will not have a sense of where they came from. They will not have a sense of what, what, the, what parents went through to bring them here. And, and really, they won't even have a clue where they should be headed. And we're asking each and every one of you who's listening to this, because it's tiring after a while to keep coming to the conferences and pretty much saying the same things and then not much change is occurring from the kinds of problems we're hearing. So reflect upon that. Reflect upon the state of our, of our community. But remember these few things I said. One, have a learning plan for the family. Have a multi-generational learning plan so that the young kids can sit in the company. We are homeschooling our children now. Mashallah, my wife does much of that work. May Allah bless her for that. But in the homeschooling co-op of Muslim families, about 12 families, they have the littlest, youngest kids, maybe two, three, four years old, learning right alongside with the teenagers. The teenagers of that homeschooling co-op are inevitably gentle with the kids, with any child, gentle, able to be patient, able to really care for them. You can say to my son Omar, now 10, here, take care of Asma for a few minutes, we have some things to do. And he'll actually gently sit there at 10 years old, and not be frustrated, not be frustrated and not feel overwhelmed, right? And he, he will inshallah manage it. So uh, I will save him the walk to come back inshallah by, by, by saying that the learning plan is important, rem reminding ourselves that the values are important. And I mentioned some of those values, modeling those uh, values are important for our children, ultimately trying to do, have the God consciousness, the sense of ithar, the sense of mercy, and really making dua at the end to say, oh Allah, this gap does exist now, but let it be a temporary thing so that as we undo it, undo this pattern that we've imitated that inshallah ta'ala the youngest will learn from the oldest and the oldest actually could still stand to learn from the wisdoms that some of our young kids do and I'll close with this story I was at a camp you know the, 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 the narration when the Bedouin came to the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu and he started urinating right in the corner of the masjid they didn't have walls and stuff you remember that story or no yes so the companions were clearly upset. I mean, who wouldn't be, right? The masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, and they wanted to just jump up and, and really, you know, attack him. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? Let him, let him be, right? Let him finish. At the camp for the youth, I said, why? I said, why do you think the Prophet ﷺ said that? 
You know, these older kids are saying this and that. This little boy in the front goes, I, I know. I say, why? He goes, because he was already urinating. If they tried to mess with him, he would go everywhere. Right? Jazakum Allah khairan. Salaam alaykum. Dr. Altaf Hussein. Next we have Sheikh Yasser Birjas. Sheikh Yasser is originally from Palestine and was born and raised in Kuwait. He started his career in electronic engineering in 1988 in the United Arab Emirates, then in Medina where he graduated as class valedictorian with the highest honors from the Islamic University of Medina's College of Sharia in 1996. In 1997, after the war was over, he went to work as a relief program aide under the international umbrella of relief agencies to rebuild war-torn Bosnia. Thereafter, and in the year 2000, he immigrated to the United States. Sheikh Yasser has served as the imam and religious leader at the Islamic Center in El Paso, Texas for nine years. Thereafter, he became the imam and youth outreach director at Orland Park Prayer Center in Illinois until 2010. And then he personally shared with me that it was too cold over there, and then alhamdulillah, he went back to Valley Ranch Masjid in Irving, Texas. He is also instructor at Al Maghrib Institute. His specialty is the subject of marriage and relations, and made him a highly sought after marriage counselor and trainer for youth in the, in the Muslim community. He is currently finishing his master's degree at the University of Phoenix in adult education and training. Let's all welcome, inshallah, Sheikh Yasser Bajas. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa nabina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa tasliman kathira thumma amma ba'd. How many of you know people who got married, just recently got married, and they're already having trouble in their relationship? Raise your hands. Come on, don't be shy. Okay, how many of you know that some of these kids, they got married, and the reason they're having trouble in their relationship because they married against the will of their parents? Raise your hands. The guys are trying to keep quiet. <laughs> How many of you would know that one of the biggest problems these kids perhaps they have in their relationship because of the different values, the different values they share with each other? Maybe because there were values imposed on them in the relationship? Raise your hands if you know it's a matter of values between these, the couple. So for everything that I'm mentioning over here, there's an issue going on. And uh, uh, Dr. Altaf Hassan, mashallah, and he entertained us very well in the introduction of the meaning of that, how that generation gap is genuine and really it's from the beginning of the relationship, the upbringing. And I would like to share with you right now some of the outcome and the result of not paying attention to that generation gap at that very young age. It ends up when our young ones, they become actually young adults. When the young adults right now are in that age where they're now we're preparing them to take over from us, they're gonna become the future of our community. They become the parents of the future. They will have their own children. And they will, we will enjoy watching them as they take over from us slowly and gradually, but suddenly we realize there is a huge cultural gap. There is no communication, or at least the communication is not as strong or as healthy as we think it is. One of the reasons for that one of the reasons for that, Ali bin Abi Talib explains that, or he explained that 1400 years ago. He said in his beautiful statement, Qala, Addibu awladakum li zamanihim la li zamanikum, fa innahum khuliqu li zamanin ghayr zamanikum. You raise your children, you raise your children for their time, not your time, because they were created in a time different than yours. It's very simple, very, very simple, but very profound. Most of our parents, when they want to raise their children, they want to, they want to bring copies of their lives. Why? Because they think they know better. And the true, they know better because there are treasures of experience. These parents, they have treasures of experience. And every parent would love to see his or her child to be more, than, more successful than they are because the success of their children is nothing but continuation of their success. And what do you think crowning or basically icing the cake for parents when it comes after their children, they finish school, they go to college and they graduate, what is the icing on that cake for them? Their marriage. 
They want to be happy to see their kids getting married, and they married to the person they think, or at least the parents they think, it will be the best for them, inshallah ta'ala. And once they secure their children in marriage, parents retire. Alhamdulillah, done my job. Khalas, you don't own right now. Not realizing in the process, we somehow see things changing differently and dramatically in the Muslim community. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he said it clearly. When you raise your children, keep in your mind their time, not your time. Ask yourself as a parent, how many of you, they lived during the time when there were things like cell phones? Anyone lived in the time of cell phones 20, 50 years ago? How about uh, iPads? Anyone uh, know anything about Facebook until maybe five minutes ago? <laughs> so you see, there are so, much th so many things happen. The younger generation, parents, they cannot catch up with sometimes. And unfortunately, it's creating the gap because parents, just like Dr. Altaf mentioned, there is no much communication between the parents and the children, they're too busy sometimes to communicate with their kids. So the kids, they start a divergence in those two paths. The kids were going one way, and the parents would go another way. And I would like to share with you, inshallah, wa ta'ala here, seven points I have seen as gaps into the, marriage, into the culture of marriage in the Muslim community today. Seven gaps that needs to be bridged in regard to the understanding of marriage between the youth and the elders and their parents. And I'm going to be very honest and very blunt with you at some points because these are very serious matters and these are actually real issues. Number one, number one is the concept, the concept of marriage itself. You know, our kids, they grow up, our kids, they grow up in this culture watching TV and reading stories and novels and romance and more than seeing marriage in real life from their parents, from their elders. Most of the elders, they model their marriage from their parents and from their aunts and uncles when they were growing up, the, the young ones, they sit down among the, the adults. The adults would be talking and chit-chatting and sometimes raising their voices as they converse with each other. The kids are just watching. They're learning. They can model off these examples. If you ask yourself, your kids, your kids, how often do they socialize with adults, with elders in the community? Most of their time is were on circles, young circles. So when it comes to the concept of marriage, they're taking it from a completely different, different source. This is the media. So they watch TV. All what they know about marriage is supposed to be based on what? Based on what, Ijma? Are you scared to say the word? Love. It has to be based on love, right? OK, what is the number one option to prove that it's based on love? It has to be beauty, the value of love for them. So when they want to get married, I always face these kids and they come to me, they said, I want you to help me you know, find someone. I said, okay, what are you looking for? So Allah, I want this. They give me slogans, of course. We're going to talk about that later. So they gave me slogans and I said, tell me more. What do you say? You know, I want someone who's beautiful, who is this. I said, tell me what is your standard of beauty? The standard of beauty for them is unrealistic. It says, you know what, Wallah, that's a very good choice. If you find me, I want to marry her, inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> They bear descriptions from Jannah. <laughs> they give you just a said, Wallahi, that's amazing if you can find one like this. Yeah. Oh, she's perfect. Mashallah. <laughs> and they gave advice. I said, by the way, never ask someone to look for something like this for you. Because they're going to take it for themselves. <laughs> but my point, the concept is completely different. So when it comes to the subject of love, indeed, relationship should be based on that. However, how do you define it? I have a whole seminar based on that I'm teaching called Fiqh of Love and Love Notes. Whole seminar on the subject. The concept of love and how it is supposed to be translated into real life. When it comes to love, we have two values here. The parents, they tell their kids, listen, this is nonsense. You get married, you'll fall in love afterwards, inshallah ta'ala. And for the kids to say, how do you want me to marry someone I don't love? True statements, both. But how do you translate that in real life? That is the problem. The young ones, they have this Cinderella model of love. It's all about beauty. She's beautiful. And subhanAllah, he fell, he fell in love for a shoe. That's the problem in this story. And he went around the entire city looking for that foot that would fit in that glass shoe. And whoever that person is, regardless how beautiful, how ugly it might be, that's it. She's the one. These are the things, the images of love that comes to, you know, the, the, the hearts and minds of our younger ones. 
But for the parents as well, they say, listen, I live with your mom for the past 50 years. Alhamdulillah, we have no issues in regard to the subject of love. You ask the mother, she says, well, I have to put up with many things. <laughs> but at least they survived. And they, have, they literally lived happily ever after. So there are huge, actually, issues when it comes to the concept of love. How do you define that? How do you bridge the gap between your children and, uh, and the parents? Many cases I have seen today because of people, the kids, they go to school uh, on their own. They are in college right now. Specifically, those who come from high school, freshmen, they go to college. They think college is all about falling in love. That's it. So the first year, most of freshmen will be just, you know, looking around and just, you know, having fun and wasting time, basically. Why? Because they just train that this is how the culture is here. And once they fall in love with someone, they come to you and say, I want to get married. How old are you, Habibi? 17. And how old is she, mashallah? She's 15. And it's so cute, but it's, it cannot be real. It's, it's so difficult. Wallah, I'm telling you, by the way, it's a real scenario. It happened when someone came to me. It's a real scenario, not once, not twice, wallah. Many, many examples. The young man is in, in college, barely freshman or finishing high school, and he wants to marry someone who's still barely in action in her first year in, in high school. I said, this is, indeed, I tell him, this is, this is wallah, this is so cute. But I don't think it's real. You have to wake up, and you have to make sure that you, the concept of marriage is clear to you. Now, if I ask you the question, how many of you parents, how many of you parents discuss the concept of marriage when they're with their children when they're about 15, 16 years old? Anyone? Wow. Young ones, how many of you heard serious talks about marriage from your parents when you were about 15, 16 years old? See, just few. Few. And that's why when it comes to getting married, they have no experience. They have no theoretical even concept of it. It's all what they watch in TV, what they read in these, uh, in these magazines. Number two, the second thing, the choice. Okay, now we understand the concept of love. Fine. I understand the concept of marriage. Fine. But whom should I choose for marriage? This is one of the biggest challenges we have in the Muslim community. For our children, for our children, they want to be completely independent in their choices. They have the full right and Islam sanctions that for them. Even the girls, when someone proposes and she's not happy with him, she has the full right to say, no, I don't want this guy. And no one has the right to force her to marry someone against her will. No one has the right to do that, including parents. So when it comes to the choice, our kids, they live different, again, time and different culture from their parents. Most of our kids, they live on campuses more than they do at home. So when they intermingle with this community, also when they come to the masjid, they also intermingle with a lot of people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different colors, and so on. So the, the children, they grow up, they grow up in terms of culture, they grow up completely uh, uh, colorblind in terms of cultural boundaries. They don't see that. So when they want to get married and someone from a different culture proposes, or they propose someone to their parent, they say, what? Are you serious? But he's not Arab. <laughs> so what's the problem? Yeah. It, it, so it becomes a completely cultural shock for the parents. And sometimes even the, the, the boy or the girl. The parents, they introduce someone to their children, says, but dad, I mean, she wasn't born here. She didn't grow up in this culture, in this society. How am I going to communicate with her? Don't worry, she can cook very well, inshallah ta'ala. So the only thing we know from the culture is the spices and the sharwal kameez, that's it. But reality has changed. These kids, they don't see these boundaries. So they now easily start introducing their parents to people of other cultures. The older generation is still holding actually tight to their old Yani traditions. It has to be someone from our, not even just culture, it's actually from our family. To that extent. And then guess what, which is not fair. They let their children choose. So listen, you choose anyone, as long as he from, from, from an Arab culture, from Palestine, from Ramallah, from that, from that town, they live in that street when they were in back 1950s, and their, their family is so and so, and then you have the choice, inshallah ta'ala. <laughs> and that's when they say, but dad, I think that's my cousin. I say, mashallah alaik, haras. You got the choice. <clears throat> 
Choices have changed for the children. <laughs> Our kids, they have varieties now. Because again, they grew up in a Muslim, American Muslim culture. They don't see these colors, they don't see these boundaries. That's why when their parents want them to adhere to an old tradition, they're trying to force their zaman, their time on the, taman of, on the zaman at the time of their children. So it becomes an issue of conflict. Some of the kids under pressure, they give in, so they accept. And sometimes the parents, they give in and they accept, but not willingly. And that's why they always have trouble in that relationship. Had they done that out of good faith and love and understanding of the opposite culture of their children, their parents, they will have no trouble. They would, mashallah, will succeed in this relationship. Number three. Another thing we have here is the issue of vocabulary. The issue of vocabulary. One of uh, the main and, and most common yani, requests of the younger ones and their parents when they want to look for someone, the kids in particular, they ask me for, to help them find someone for them. I said, what exactly are you looking for? You know what is the first word they say? What is the number one choice they have? One word, they say, what is it? I need someone who is? Can you guess? Religious. The younger generation, they say, I want someone who is religious. And guess what? Sometimes these words come from the least religious person. <laughs> Why is that? Because for them, when we were still having fun in college, it was for the fun of it. But now when I want to get married, hey, listen, that's serious now. <laughs> I need someone who is religious. So I don't keep looking behind my back. I want someone that I can trust. That's what they say. But now when we come to saying religious, we're talking about vocabulary over here right now. You ask the children and the parent to bring someone religious for them. So the mother, she says, MashaAllah, she's religious. But mom, she doesn't pray. Yeah, but she, mashallah, she's from a good family. But yeah, but they don't even pray. They even they sell alcohol. Well, but they're a very good family. Their, their grandfather used to be imam of the masjid in our village back in 1940s and all this stuff and so on. So the concept of religiosity is completely different, distorted. Same thing, sometimes as the father wants to, let's say, wants to put the concept of religion first for their children. But we start arguing over what is religious and what is liberal. Our kids, they grow up in the masajid more, they spend more time in the masajid than, some of our kids basically, more than their parents. And their parents, they grew up in a culture, being in the masjid is just, you know, luxury. But for our kids here, it's essential. Because it's instincts of survival, they want to know who they are, who, what's their identity as a Muslim living in America. Most of the parents, they grew up in Muslim countries, so coming to the masjid was, a, was given. So there is no question about it. And that's why when they say, I want someone who is religious, they want someone who support their views in terms of salah, ibadah, being faithful to Allah subhanahu wa to their deen and so on. And our parents, they have the traditional format of being religious. So we have a cultural gap here that needs to be bridged. Parents, they need to understand how kids think when it comes to the concept of religion. What do they want exactly? They need someone to help them in their ibadah and their deen. And by the way, for the parents, if you know now that most of these young men, even the, most, the least religious, when they want to get mad, they start looking for someone who's seriously religious, you better raise your children to be religious. Otherwise, they're going to lose in the market of marriage. Thinking that exposing your kids to be completely, ultimately free from any kind of ethical, you know, and responsibility, religious responsibility, that once they get married, inshallah, they'll take care of themselves afterwards. It doesn't happen that way. You have to show them the, the, the way, how to become religious. Number four. Weddings, Allahu Akbar. You guys, talk, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> when it comes to weddings, the kids, they just want to get married. You know, let's do it in uh, one of these restaurants here in Patterson, inshallah ta'ala, and we live happily ever after. What's the problem with that, guys? But uh, uh, <laughs> sometimes when we do these weddings, it's actually, it's not that, it's not realistic. And in many cases, it's not for the kids to get married, it's for the parents to uh, be happy. Let me put it this way only. They want to be happy that they were able to achieve such a magnificent wedding that they can talk about like Yani Cinderella, inshallah, in the future. 
And on top of that, we have another problem is the girl also, she grew up watching all these uh, TV shows and all these wedding dresses programs and all the stuff and so on. She can never accept anything less than that. So now they're competing with all these fantasies. They want to build their house, also their castle to be above the cloud, Yanni. For the guy, he comes and he's counting his dinars and dollars. One, two, three, four, five. Most of our younger generation, most of our younger generation, they're getting married with about 50,000 in average, 50,000 debts in average. Why? Just to cover their expenses that their parents paid for their marriages, let alone the other loans that they get from here and there. So can you imagine yourself getting married, having another mortgage on your back just to cover up because of just uh, to, to finish because of your marriage? It's very stressful. So when it comes to the concept of marriage, the easy the wedding is, the more the barakah. I had to intervene in a situation when one brother, he came to me, begging me to help him. I said, what's going on? His father wants him to delay his wedding or his marriage for next year. I said, but we're ready, alhamdulillah. He's a mashallah, he's finishing, his, his, he has his job, and he's ready to get married. The only reason is because his father, he says, I don't have the money yet. I said, for what? He says, for the wedding. How much are we talking about here? If you need something, I'll give you, inshallah ta'ala. He goes, $120,000. I said, uh, for what? <laughs> That's only for the wedding because they're gonna fly their cousins and second and third, fifth cousins from Pakistan and bring them to the country here and bring all these people, shady holes that has never heard of before. I said, 120,000 and guess what? That's his share. Forget about the girl's family's share. I said, wallahi, that's unbelievable. To spend close to one quarter of a million of dollars on wedding and then next day in the morning, you're gonna wake up saying, that's it? So what happened with all these $250,000? They're gone with the wind. So I, I called and I intervened. I said, could you please give him 50% of that pocket change so he can start off, inshallah ta'ala, without student loan? And then, bidnillahi, he will continue with his marriage. Finally, after negotiation with the father, he accepted. But he said, we're going to have to wait six more months at least. <laughs> I, said, I told the, the guy, the kid, I said, keep quiet. You're good, inshallah ta'ala. Six months better than one year. And having $60,000 in your pocket, be happy and just keep quiet, khalas. At least it's a compromise. I'm against, still against it, but it's a compromise. So we have these concepts of weddings that beyond the means of these young men and women who are getting married. Number five, our social circles. <clears throat> our social circles, they're one of the main sources of education for us. Whether we like it or not, your kids are learning from their peers more than they learn from you. When was the last time you were sitting with your children on a dinner table and give them not lecture, but manners, akhlaq, exchanging, you know, beautiful talks and words and so on? When was the last time? Except that, eat with your right hand. Don't drink with your left hand. Don't talk while you eat. Don't chew too loud. But when was there any kind of communication beyond the instructions like this? Few times. So our kids, they're not learning from the social interaction with parents as much as they would go and learn from actually from their friends. And if you ask your kids and your children, who is the, and by the way, I made one time actually, I made a survey in a workshop, and I asked these young guys, early freshman college, maybe one or two years, one or two years in college, and high schoolers, I said, if you have serious trouble, if you have serious trouble, who would be the first person that you would contact? And I have them write down the answers. The top number one, number one basically, the top uh, uh, person they would communicate with or would talk to would be a friend, the closest friend, number one, the top person. The second, that's not even a parent, the second person would be actually, some of them they said cousins, some of them they said teachers. And the third, not even parents, Wallah, they came after the third choice. And when I discussed that further, I realized that the, the reason these kids, they don't really want to communicate with their parents because they believe their parents are always judgmental. And whenever they try to bring this issue up, they get upset, they don't want to hear it. And they just want to finish it instantly and that's it. So there is no conversation between them. Our kids are learning from their social circles more than we learn from, our, from, our, from, from us. So you make sure that you give them the chance 
You talk to them. You give them the venue so they can communicate and express themselves to you. This, in my case, my son, and my oldest son is 13 years old right now. So I'm officially a father of a teenager. Allah uh, musta'an. But since he was very young, I told him that. And he doesn't like I mentioned this story. Forgive me, my son. When he was still about 10 years old, we were talking about the values of, you know, of family values and, and being you know, responsible of being a father and so on. So he was asking me, I always tell him, if you have any serious question about anything like that, come to me first. Don't go to anybody else. So alhamdulillah, he trusts me. He comes. He asks these questions. So one day he was asking a very you know, serious question about marriage and so on. And as I was driving him to the Quran uh, program, uh, when we arrived, but just before he stepped out of the car, he goes, Dad, he says, I think I made a decision. I said, Bismillah. He's 10 years old, 11 years old. So what is it? He goes, I want to get married. <laughs> so I, I took it seriously, wallahi. I didn't mock him at all. I was, I was holding my laughter, of course. But I, was, I told him, you know what? Wallahi, my son, you have my support. Inshallah, you have my support. But finish school first, quickly. And then, inshallah, you go to college, find your job, and I'll help you, inshallah, with ta'ala. He said, Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> But the point is, if there is a serious issue, he comes to me first. Because he knows that I'm going to let him, let him talk, let him speak. I won't judge him. And I'm going to try to help him fix the situation. And he's a human being after all. And kid, subhanAllah. You have to understand that. Number six and seven, I'll finish that real quick, inshallah ta'ala. Number six is venues. Venues to look for prospects. Many parents, they want their girls, specifically for girls, they want their girls to get married in the most traditional format, which means uh, Prince Charm comes on his white horse, tying it upside the house, and knock on the door, he says, I want to marry your daughter. <laughs> it doesn't happen like this anymore these days. Right, girls? It's very hard. Many parents, they tell their daughter, say, listen, no, I'm not going to accept this guy. He needs, to, he needs to bring his family, he needs to bring his, his parents, this and that, and so on. Or they say, wait until someone comes and proposes. But the guy is there. Why don't you talk to him? So why don't you talk to him? And the father would say, uh, no, I'm not going to speak to him. OK, fine. So how can I bring this guy in then? So there's a dilemma. And we put our children in a very awkward situation. They can't do it in the masjid. They can't do it in conferences. They can't do it in the traditional way. And they can't do it even online, and you want them to get married. And on top of that, parents, they don't actively pursue or look for their children. No, they want the other people to come and, and pursue, basically, their kids. And in reality, it doesn't happen like this anymore. We have to see, see some compromise. You need to see, talk to your kids and see what options do they have in their, in their real life. And the same thing, you as parents, you need to go and introduce options to your children. They might overlook some of these options, but subhanAllah might be the best option for them. The kids inherited uh, this bias against guided marriages. I'm not going to use arranged marriages, which is you have to marry him, otherwise you're not my daughter anymore. No, it's guided marriage. It's basically, why don't you check out this guy? Let's bring the family over and see what he might be the good person for you. I say, if someone suggests someone like this to you with the full freedom to say yes or no, don't say no. Give them a chance. Same thing for the guys. Why don't you go and check it out? It might be the best option for you. So the parents might have, again, treasures of experience for you. At the same time, parents, they need to accept the fact that their kids, they're going into completely different society, different culture. You have to seek some compromise on the issue on how to find prospects for your children. The last point, the issue of readiness, being ready. If I ask these kids right now, the guys in particular, how many of you believe that those who are single? Raise your hands. Can you raise your hands? Those who are single. OK, mashallah, we have good amount, good number over here. Keep them up, keep them up, don't worry. I'm not going to mark it for you, but just keep them up, yani. <laughs> now, how many of you believe they're ready? <laughs> if you believe you're ready, keep your hands up. How many of you know that their parents believe they're ready? Keep your hands up. So eventually, most of them will prop their hands down because their parents won't think that they're ready for it yet. Said, so, listen, my son, finish first. Okay, but dad, I'm already 29 years old. 
<laughs> yeah, but you're still in school. Don't embarrass me. And he's doing PhD degree. So, and that's a real scenario, by the way. That's a real scenario. Someone has been prevented from seeking the, uh, marriage because he's still in school. I said, your parents don't know, they don't understand that PhD is not that kindergarten type of school, right? <laughs> we have wrong perceptions about being ready. How are you, how do you think you're ready? Uh, but the kids, they think they're ready be some, simply because they fall in love, that's it. Because we're in love, everything is gonna fall in place, inshallah ta'ala, and we shall live happily ever after. Kids, that's wrong, that's only in movies. And again, Allah, I don't even know if it happens in movie either. But you need to be realistic about it. For the parent, you need also to push your children to be ready. And one of the biggest mistakes parents are doing, they're pushing the age of maturity for their children farther and farther. Why? Because we are, we are correlating the age of maturity with finishing school. So as long as you're in school, don't think about finding a, a, a part-time job. Don't even try to volunteer. Don't do anything else. Don't, don't distract yourself from school and education and so on. So eventually just school, school, school. Okay, but I want, I want car. I'll get you the car. How am I gonna fill it gas? I'll pay you. So eventually the kids, they're already actually going to medical school, driving Mercedes or BMWs, even Lexus, mashallah. They're having pocket change more than my salary perhaps even. And then I would just ask the guy, I said, why aren't you married yet? He goes, because uh, my parents, they think I'm not ready yet. <laughs> and seriously, I said, you're not ready, Masha, you have all of this, you're not ready yet? So we need to figure it out. We need to he help our kids and our younger ones to get prepared for marriage. Same thing with the girls. Parents, they keep pushing the girl to finish school first, finish school first. And unfortunately, they prepare them for the wrong reason. If you ask most girls, why aren't you getting married while you're still in school? It's just because parents, they want me to finish college first. Fine, no problem. But why do they want you to finish college first? That's where we have the problem. What is the number one reason, ladies? The number one reason they want you to finish college first. What would it be for? Don't be shy. No, not independent. Well, semi, but for what? there's another word for it. They use the word just in case. You know what's the meaning of just in case? You guys know what does it mean? What is it? Just in case it didn't work out, alhamdulillah, you have your education to stand on. You know what we gave our, our girls? We gave them the excuse, the exit door. That's why we have high rate of divorce within the first two years of marriage among the youth in America. Very high rate of divorce. You have no idea how many counseling sessions had to do with young guys because of that situation. The girls, the moment she come into the relationship, things go rough a little bit because they're still getting too used to each other. But the moment she sees that, she goes, Alhamdulillah, I have my education. Salaam Alaikum. <laughs> we taught our girls wrong value about their education. I'm not saying that should not be educated. I'm saying go for it, but change your perception of it. Instead of taking this as just in case or a safety net, as they call it also, instead of taking it as a safety net, take this as an opportunity to improve your relationship. You're educated, you can figure things out, right? You're supposed to be educated to work your marriage very well. Not to get away from a, a, a tough and rough relationship. You are not gonna have that uh, Romeo and Juliet marital relationship, not even marital relationship actually, it's a tragedy. So if you're gonna base your marriage always on romance, it's not like that all the time. So you're gonna have to be ready to face some difficulties in the relationship. Education should qualify you to overcome these difficulties. There are so many things actually in the, in the subject of marriage that needs to be a bridge between the two generations. And I hope inshallah ta'ala as the bottom line for this whole issue that the younger generation, they should understand our parents. They're very protective because they have treasures of experience. You need to talk to them, talk to your parents and ask them, help me out. How can I go over these issues? What do we do in these cases and so on? On the other hand, parents, please, please, please get out of your comfort zone when it comes to the subject of marriage. You're gonna have to talk to your kids about things you dislike. You're gonna have to face challenges you're not happy with. You're just always scared that this is coming. You have to face it. 
and you have to talk to your kids and have them getting ready for that, inshallah tabaraka wa ta'ala. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammad wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Yasser Bajas and Dr. Altaf Hussain. One more time for both of them, inshallah. So inshallah, we have a 15 minute break. The next lectures are in this room, distress, isolationism, and spirituality. We have in the Derby room, Ask Me Anything, the American Muslim Youth Panel. And we have the Khutbah Preparatory Workshop in the seminar room. All of those seminars begin at four o'clock. Wa jazakallah khair, wa alaykum wa rahmatullah.